tonight, Mr. Edmund Bacon, formerly executive director of the Philadelphia City Planning Commission and Development Coordinator. He resigned that position in May of 1970. At the present time, he is, he is involved with a development firm doing work in Massachusetts, in Montreal, and in Atlanta, Georgia. He was born in Philadelphia in 1910. He is an architect and city planner. He studied architecture at Cornell University, and he had a fellowship in city planning at Cranbrook Academy in 1936. He has been a visiting lecturer at many, many schools across the country, but especially the University of Pennsylvania. He is a trustee in the American Academy in Rome. He is on the executive committee of Urban America Incorporated and is a board member of the Franklin Institute. His book, Design of Cities, he is currently revising. And it was very interesting to me that in the field of architecture, books generally do not get a very broad circulation. Six to 10,000 is a, is a good number of books to publish in the architectural field. His Design of Cities sold 31,000 copies and he tells me is now scheduled for 20,000 more copies in the revised edition. He worked most of his life in Philadelphia, but he's also worked in Shanghai, China, in uh, Flint, Michigan. It's a real pleasure for us to have Mr. Ed Bacon with us tonight. Ed? Thank you very much, Dean Sappenfield, Mayor Cooley, students and others. I like very much being in uh, Muncie. Uh, I like being in this particular type of terrain, which is new to me. I must uh, parenthetically comment that uh, when you're in a land like this, I think, the architect and planner has a special responsibility because I think uh, it's very important to have a very strong sense of place. Uh, and I think that that gives a special challenge to the designer. I like being at this school because it's so darn new uh, and in a very very heartfelt way, Dean and students, I say to you, for goodness sake, don't make the mistake that every other school in the United States made. The one thing that I don't like about what I know so far is this is called what? The School or the Department of Architecture and Planning. Is that right? right. What is no, it called? College of Architecture. Oh, neither was right. The College of Architecture and Planning. And I would just like to throw that and out. You don't have any planners here yet, and I'm telling you that when they come, don't treat them the way architects all over the place treat all other planners, and that's bad. In every single architectural school in the United States, except this one, and you haven't gotten yet to be mad at, the planners are mad at the architects, and the architects are mad at the landscape architects, and the regional planners are mad at the planners. And uh, you even get subdivisions where the urban designers are mad at the regional planners. And uh, it's all absolutely ridiculous and is all very, very, very vitiating. And I, in a very, very serious way, say to you that since you have not yet made this particular mistake, at least I assume you haven't yet, uh, and therefore you are not yet in a rut do not develop this rut. And if you avoid it, you will be a unique institution in the United States and you will stand out like a shining light. And so I'm saying that I think it's great that you're going, that you're young, that you haven't made these mistakes yet. And I hope very, very deeply that you will be able to develop in the faculty and in the minds of the students a sense of uh, 
the uh, unity of the whole thing. The topic is supposed to be, I think, uh, architecture, planning, and politics. Uh, it's one of those things that I uh, cooked up on the spur of the moment. But uh, frankly, I'm not displeased with it at all. First of all, at the dinner tonight, I think we had a very good representation of that range of interests in the community. Uh, <coughs> and uh, the main message I would really like to convey is that architecture, planning, and politics are all one thing. And for architecture to be worth anything at all, it's got to uh, take into account the realities of public decision making. And the popular way to talk about that is politics. And I also can prove to you by my own work, and I say this unequivocally, that architecture is potentially very powerful politically, a fact which most architects don't know. And it was certainly clear to me in our discussions this evening that the function which the designer ought to bring to the kind of discussion about what kind of a city you're trying to make out of Muncie or any other city is a really important and basic and vital one. And if you only do it right, it's worthwhile. Now, actually, it used to be in my more naive days when I faced a group of people like you that I had the thought that somehow, maybe to one of you, I would convey the point, which is that as a designer, if you want to bother to do it, and you really set for yourself a self-formulated program to deal with one little piece of God's earth, a little town, Muncie or Philadelphia, or others, <laughs> and uh, you make a commitment to yourself, and I mean to yourself and to nobody else, that within the complete limits of your own power and capacity, you will do absolutely everything that can be done to make that particular bit of God's earth better than it was before. We talked about continuity. And the, the silly part of it is that I speak to you from the kind of business that uh, the dean read, which makes me sound very distant and, and uh, kind of uh, uh, peculiar. But the fact of the case is that it wasn't so very long ago that I was sitting in the chair where you are, and I was much less sure of myself than you are. And the one thing that I did manage to prove is that if anybody wants to care about it, and as a designer, wants in one city to continuously work in the effort to bring the design message to the decision-making process of that city, it will work, it will work, it will work. And I've yet to find a single person that ever tried to do it, and it didn't work. Uh, and that the response which you get in the area of the political leaders, and after all, I worked under four mayors, uh, the first of which was a Republican, and he was thrown out of office with three suicides and uh, uh, total disgrace, and the reformed Democrat, Joe Clark, took over. But he took me over as well, and then I worked with him, and then I worked with... Uh, with uh, Mayor Dilworth, who was a splendid patrician type of mayor, and then I worked with Mayor Tate, who was a splendid not patrician type of mayor. And then I decided four mayors is all I could stand, and I quit. But I still had quite a time with those four mayors. And uh, as a matter of fact, Mayor Tate, and this is very shocking to academic planners, Mayor Tate, uh, during the last two years of his administration, uh, decided that he wanted me to be not only his planner, but also his development coordinator. 
So he put me directly in charge of all development of the whole city of Philadelphia and asked me to attend all of his cabinet meetings, which I did for a two-year period. And so I really saw how decisions were made. And by the way, Mayor, I'm sure it's true here too, but in Philadelphia, uh, Mayor Tate was also the chairman of the Re Democratic City Committee. Maybe you don't have such things here, I don't know. But he was not only mayor, but he also was the main political power. So when we made decisions in cabinet, they were made. And uh, it was very, uh, very interesting to see this function. Uh, now, the fact of my work, you may all dislike as much as you wish. You may also, during the question period, get as much self-satisfaction as you wish expressing your dislike and disgust with the work which I do. And that will bother me not a particle. Um, <laughs> during most of my life, I had to win every argument, and I got so much into the habit of it that if we do have a question period, you will find that I still do it by habit. But I don't really have to win the arguments anymore at all because practically everything I wanted got built. That's a slight exaggeration, but at least enough of it got built, so there's no reason to argue about it anymore. And having once been built, then the you and those after you and those after, after you can make up their own mind about whether they like it or not. So therefore, I'm not so terribly concerned, although I'm glad to have your viewpoint, on whether you like my work, but I am concerned that you get the message that if you want to bother to do what I did, which is very simple, but you do have to work at it, uh, that the thing you want, you can do in your own terms, in your own time, in your own way. And that is the message that I would like to bring to you. I suppose uh, before I do start on the slides and give you a very, uh, I think, down-to-earth work presentation of what I've done in Philadelphia, I, I will make just a couple of comments about uh, my uh, review uh, earlier today, five minutes each on three uh, thesis projects. And I was uh, very interested in what I saw, and I uh, was very impressed with what I saw. Uh, having said that, I will now make two or three very explicit and heartfelt suggestions. Number one, when studying any problem whatsoever, please remind yourself every moment that what you are doing is dealing not with a building and not with architecture, but with the land. The land is the generic source of all decent design. And the land is a very, very complex and sensitive thing. Here, this will work. The terrible enemy of the architect is white paper. White paper, which every architect starts with, gives you the totally absolutely vilely false image that you're dealing with an anonymous site. And secondly, the idea that the site has boundaries and you can pick it up. You can't. It's the earth and you cannot detach it from the total continent of the earth which extends in that direction and that direction clear around and meets back at this side. And if you do think in terms of the land and not the buildings, you will get a different form than you get when you think of a form and then simply stick it down on a convenient site. And this is back, thank you. And uh, the, uh, let me see, there's a second part of this, uh, that uh, you, uh, mm. it's the, uh, oh, I know, this, this is the practical part of the practical part of it, pardon me, pardon me, pardon me. I, didn't sleep well last night. <laughs> Whenever you do a drawing, for goodness sakes, start with a clean and beautiful drawing of at least a quarter of a mile in every direction of your site. And then work in onto your site from the factors which impinge on it on the outside. And I think this is a very, very explicit point, which I think is highly relevant to what I saw today. Incidentally, I will mention that in Market East, I had an incredible fight, a bloody fight, with Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill for one reason, that the draftsmen in their office drew a border around a sheet which happened to have its central axis in the middle of a block, and the axis of the whole thing was a half block over on a street. 
And I could not get out of their mind that they were designing where the central axis based on a perfectly arbitrary edge which they put on a piece of Philadelphia. So I'm dealing here with real issues. And I really do mean that if you, in your drawing and your thinking, uh, start and always draw the whole environment and then move in on your building from the outside, it absolutely will produce a different form than otherwise. And that the form has got to respond to the whole uh, richness of the impactment of the environment in various directions. I saw a design which I was uh, very excited about, which had a wonderful movement system through it, and I think some of the stuff I show you will be relevant to that, uh, connecting two parts of a, a, a commuter college, I think. But on both sides of it were two totally different impacts from the environment. One was a road that came close to it with a cheesy little drive off and a place in there. And the other was a great view over to what they call the knobs, is that right? Buttons, the things that, hills that stick up. What do you call those? What? Knobs. Knobs, thank you, knobs. A few knobs. But the, 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 the design should absolutely make you sense as you move along the central movement system that this side was the coming in by the street and that side was the zoom out across this wonderful, wonderful uh, terrain to knobs. Now, if we put out the lights, I will show you some of the stuff that I've done in Philadelphia, and I hope it will have some relevance to what we're interested in here. I'm trying to do a uh, dual uh, show, and I'm not used to this, so I will probably make an incredible number of mistakes. Uh, if you will forgive me, I hope. Uh, the uh, slide to the left, to your right, I'm sorry, that's your right. The slide to your right is the model which was built in 1947 by the uh, City Planning Commission, and I worked on some of the designing of it. It was part of an exhibition which was supported by the businessmen and by the mayor. The mayor put up 100,000 and the businessmen put up 100,000. It was in Gimbel's store, and it was seen by 300,000 people, and it made an impact on the collective mind of Philadelphia from which it never recovered. And it involved school children in 13 schools from kindergarten to a technical senior high school. And the children went out into their own neighborhoods and in their own way recorded the conditions in their own community and made their own models, drawings, and plans. And then uh, in their own frame of reference, they made their own uh, concept for how they would like the community to be improved. Uh, this is entirely different from having them study somebody else's plan, as was done in Chicago. And now they're grown up and voting for the bond issues. Uh, oh, I did it wrong. I did it wrong. Uh, there, now we're back. This is uh, a photograph on the left of, uh, that'll work, I think. This is a photograph on the left is of Independence Hall, which is where the Declaration of Independence was signed in the foreground. And in the background shows the way it was when we started work. And on the right-hand side is a view, unfortunately not up to date, but nonetheless of the uh, consequence of our work in this area. And uh, to the right of that is a very large office building rising. And this was the means we used to counteract a uh, deterioration of this area, which was uh, moving forward and which was a matter of great concern to us. Uh, this shows that the... Um, thing which I showed you, uh, namely this uh, mall here, was part of a uh, organized uh, underlying system of movement. This is Independence Hall. These are two of the original William Penn plans. And here it was the monumental uh, greenway. And this is the series of greenway footways through the middle of the blocks which I designed in 47. Uh, not along the edge of the street, but separated from the street by going through the middle of the block. And this whole thing is really a village scale. Uh, this is too uh, scale. It could easily be operative in Muncie. And that shows how the idea of it grew, how the uh, pay towers were introduced in relation to the movement systems which impinged on them from the outside, how it extended across to Washington Square, how we developed along the waterfront the uh, a very fine uh, Penn's Landing Park, and then developed the system back to the Lucan Synagogue at this point, so that it was all based on a very clear image of a circulation system. Uh, this is something of the actual development of it. The left-hand one is the extension of the mall with the uh, fountains and the 
garden designed by uh, Dan Carley. And on the right-hand side is the beginning of the greenway system from the beautiful, uh, well-preserved uh, Strickland facade of the Second Bank of the United States uh, moving toward uh, uh, Locust Street. Uh, this is a before and after photograph. I should really do it the other way around. Uh, this is on the left-hand side is a view on Locust Street only a short time ago, and on the right-hand side is a view from the same identical location as it exists at this moment. And you see, we were not afraid to introduce high-rise into the uh, 18th century city, uh, and this was part of a general revitalization which uh, was very important. Uh, this is part of the Greenway extension at the left, showing how we used this spire of St. Peter's and drew its character into the depths of the community uh, by this cut through. Here you see a footway in the middle of the block and therefore separated from traffic. This is the kind of thing which works on a very small scale and very well. This is uh, another view of the restoration of one of the little centers. Uh, and uh, here is the beginning of another part of this development. This was the old wholesale produce market. Uh, the business leaders organized the uh, Food Distribution Center Corporation, and they moved this whole function down to a great new center, which functioned very efficiently and rebuilt this particular location uh, in this fashion. Here is the location here of the photograph, which is on your left side. And uh, this had a uh, total effect of revitalizing the area around it. There were three great corporations which had decided to move their headquarters out to the suburbs. Now, if you were a good statistical planner and you put in the computer the factors to be considered and you came up with a conclusion that Central City would lose 15,000 jobs, you would have been exactly right because they would have been gone. But we took a different view we revitalized the area, and each of those three corporations changed their mind and decided to stay, and as a chain reaction, we now have a really vital city center all the way the two-mile length from the Delaware River to, uh, to the uh, uh, Schuylkill River. This is all in accordance with a carefully conceived uh, cyclical feedback uh, operation which shows on your left-hand circle the comprehensive plan <coughs> which is shown over here to the right, uh, is to be sure important in our work, but it wasn't actually the generating source. It came about uh, somewhat uh, after. We go around the circle. Oh, I wanted to show you something about the comprehensive plan. Uh, it is unique amongst all comprehensive plans in the sense that it has a money dimension. And this is the total cost of building it. Here is the uh, purposes for which the money would be used. And here is the uh, uh, source of the money at this point. But the uh, money was then interpreted into uh, this uh, capital program, uh, which came about at our recommendation when the reform came in 52, under which the City Planning Commission itself prepared the six-year capital program. I mentioned to Mayor Cooley uh, this evening at dinner, I don't know whether he especially enjoyed it, that uh, under the charter provision that we wrote, uh, the City Planning Commission presents the capital program for all money to be spent over the next six years to the mayor, and the mayor is legally not permitted to change one line of it. He has to forward it through to the City Council the way he received it. Uh, there's a point to that in that the mayor's cabinet is well represented on the Planning Commission, so it really wasn't all that bad, but nevertheless. And this is the uh, map which is published in which every project to be built for the six years is shown. And if you live in this neighborhood and you see that little kid there with a baseball bat and a number, you go to the rest of the book and you see that there will be a playground in your neighborhood which will be built in 1960, uh, 1974. And uh, therefore, you develop under this uh, process a tremendous kind of support for the entire program, which would never be forthcoming as long as these projects were considered as separate individual entities. And this is a very important underlying factor of it. This is a representation of a basic value system of the community in which each of its various kinds of needs is given a systematic total emphasis in relation to all other needs. On the left-hand side in black, 
is the amount of money spent for each facet of community development in the previous six years. And on the right-hand side in red is the policy proposed to be expended in the future six years. So when you appear at city council uh, for the League of Women Voters or for the neighborhood group or for a ghetto group or anybody else, you can discuss the specifics of the projects and you can discuss the kind of social policy or economic policy which is represented by the basic distribution of resources. We now go round this circle in a physical sense and I must say I think that this is very Germain de Muncie, if I may make so bold. From the comprehensive plan which we've seen, which is both the money plan and a policy of money expenditure, we come to a functional plan, uh, which is a regional plan, as in this case, which concerns itself with the survival of central Philadelphia in the face of the suburban pull. And if that has any relevance, it's purely coincidental. Uh, we see here the series of expressway networks in red which converge on Center City, the original William Penn crossing. We see the uh, two commuter railroad systems, the Penn Central and the Reading, coming into their separate termini. And we see in yellow the two subway systems which converge on Center City at this point. This is not enough. We have to come around and look at Center City uh, in terms of a very specific resolution of these uh, forces. And here it comes. Uh, let me see. I guess I'm off base on this. I am off base on that, but never mind. You don't mind this a bit of this. Uh, here is the uh, enlargement here of that central section. And here is the expressway outer loop in red. Here are the two commuter railroads uh, here joined together into a single commutation system and the two subways. The uh, orange indicates the most active business core. This is the center of the uh, banking and commercial activities. This is the center of the department stores. And here at this point, 8th and Market Street are at this one corner, three great department stores, Strawberries and Clothiers, Litz and Gimbel Brothers. But in between these two areas is a sea of blight. And the major assignment of the Planning Commission was to revitalize this section and to link these two vital areas together in such a way that the whole downtown was not threatened. This particular interpretation of the uh, structural system it was not enough. So we therefore added to it the points at which the various vehicles uh, came to rest and people got up off their seat and stood on their feet and became pedestrians. And so we added to the structure of this particular circulation system these uh, terminal points, the great parking garages which are uh, where the cars come in and people get to be pedestrians, but all completely integrated with the expressway system. Uh, here in Market East, you see we put a great parking garage parallel to the subway and with its own separate ramp off the expressway. So you drive in on the expressway directly on the ramp and into your parking space and get on your feet and never hit a red light or any confusion or delay at all. The same thing is true of the buses. And this reinforces the whole linear character of the central spine, which we are now made vital from the Delaware River here to the Schuylkill River there as a basic idea of our plan. This concept is just as relevant to Muncie as it is to Philadelphia. The scale is different, but the idea is the same. Uh, but we weren't satisfied with that. We added another dimension, which is the way in which people moved from their point of arrival to their final destination pleasantly and, and enjoyably. And therefore, we added to this structure the elements of this structure, which is the pedestrian dimension. The Society Hill network, which I spoke of, is all through this area at the surface. But in this intense area, we changed levels, and we therefore developed a continuous lower-level pedestrian footway from 18th Street all the way down to uh, the department stores at 8th and Market Street, shown in yellow, with arms that went up and down to the parking garage at this point. On the surface, we recommended taking all the traffic off of Chestnut Street 
and replacing it with electrical vehicles in both directions, which went directly into parking garages at the point of juncture with the expressways. And then uh, we developed an elevated footway. This is Wanamaker's department store, then Snellenberg's, Gimbal's, Strawberries and Clothiers and Lit, an elevated walkway which would tie all of that together at this point. And what we did here is the thing which, frankly, Dean is outside the traditional area of either the planners or the architects. From the point of view of the average planner, this is much too specific, it's project planning. From the point of view of the average architect, it's altogether too general and it's outside their competence. As a matter of fact, when we started on Penn Center, we had an official finding from the American Institute of Architects Philadelphia chapter that we shouldn't do it because nobody had yet written a program. Uh, actually, this whole issue of whether the architect is the servant or the master or the creator of the program is absolutely fundamental for the future of your practice. We now go around the uh, circle, I think, and try to see uh, what this amounts to in the next step of interpretation. And if you remember, we took the area plan and made it into a project plan. This is the model we made in 1952 of our idea then for Penn Center. And that is this particular section of this plan. There is City Hall in the middle, which is over there. And here is the end of the project. See, here we have the subway beneath the street. We have the <coughs> underground railroad, which is already built. We suggested underground parking connected with the expressway that all of these should feed into a great open air garden open to the sky going through the center of the whole project. Well, this was the uh, actual area that we were dealing with. This shows the way in which it was uh, at the time we did it. That was the famous Chinese wall. And we had no legal right to do this. Uh, we were not asked to do it. We simply said that the city of Philadelphia cannot let the opportunity go by uh, without our putting our input into the situation. When we put the plan out, everybody said, that is crazy. As a matter of fact, every single idea that we ever put out of the Planning Commission was reviled, ridiculed, and treated with total disgust at the beginning. And that goes for Society Hill, it goes for this, it goes for Market East, and for many of the housing programs. But we kept on going anyway, and uh, I'm not sure whether this is going to work. Uh, there, in fact, is a view of the development which uh, replaced this. The thinking of the power structure at the time that we introduced this particular uh, proposal for a lower level underground garden all through the whole thing, open to the sky as a great pedestrian entrance to center city spanned by skyscrapers, was one of total astonishment and they simply could not grasp the idea in 1952. But Robert Dowling, God bless him, said the total thing isn't all completely screwy. Uh, we should have a good pedestrian superblock, but cover the whole thing over with the roof. Well, this made us feel very sad. But we said, nevertheless, can't you, uh, this, by the way, is the result of lifting the garden up to the street level, which we'd originally proposed beneath the street. We said, nevertheless, can't we salvage something out of this situation? Couldn't we puncture one or two holes through this roof to bring just a little bit of light and air down to the lower level uh, pedestrian way. And we did puncture, here's the hole by the stuffers, and uh, uh, this is really a very precious space in a city because the, the traffic is all up here and you don't get messed up with traffic. And then we accomplished this, which was our next hole, and this is the subway station, and this is the only subway station in the world with a garden in it. And that is the actual view that you get from your subway car when you look at, out the window. And uh, this began to percolate in the minds of the power that be some new ideas which in 52 were very difficult for them to, to, to accept. Uh, this shows the 52 plan with the uh, uh, central garden in yellow. This shows the covering of everything. And this is the way it is now with the, the, the thrust of the uh, central space hit City Hall, which we very carefully preserved, and it bounced north and south in that fashion. And now I think I'm showing you, I don't really remember what comes next, uh, uh, I'm showing you a view on this axis, showing the way in which uh, this particular uh, uh, thrust here 
uh, resolved itself into a north-south axis. Uh, I might mention here that because this is the view of the west plaza of uh, City Hall, this is the Kling building up here, the Municipal Services building, which shows there this is City Hall. And that is the Penn Center Esplanade, which you saw before. Uh, there was a feeling, politically, Mayor, that maybe Kling had too much of the gravy, and we ought to get another architect in on this particular design. So I recommended a man whom I thought was good, and he went to work on this idea of developing an open space in this plaza in front of Kling's building. And scream at him as I did, I could not get that guy to relate his design in any way to Kling's building. He just wouldn't do it. So uh, as a simple uh, act, fortunately, I was close enough to the mayor then to do it, I saw to it that he was removed from the job. And, the <laughs> <laughs> and this, as you might have gathered, is Mr. Kling's work. And uh, I think he did very well. This is a view of uh, a corner of it the way it is now emerging under construction. And uh, let's see what we're going to get here. This is the cross-section that I was trying to show you before through this situation. This is the Municipal Services Building, which is there, which Kling designed. And you see here, here is the lower level plane beneath the street, which goes all along through the whole darn thing. This is where it hits the thrust of, of Penn Center and bounces in both directions, north and south. This is the street up here. And there is the subway, and there's the Cunary Railroad, and there's the subway surface. Uh, here, the, the whole story of it is the urge of this lower level where the people are to reach up for the light and air and outer space. And this, I think, is almost a new aesthetical principle in which the public provides the channels of of energy to the architect, and then the architect does his own individual resolution of the way you resolve it to meet the upper level. Here in the Municipal Services Building, the roof is solid and it's a two-story glass lobby. Here is the open space of the open garden, which is there where you have the sun coming in and the rain pouring down, and here is the uh, building uh, between two towers where you uh, are a glass-covered gallery with solid walls. And now I think I can show you each of these in sequence. That is a photograph of the interior of this, where you see the pedestrian space over here, and you see the sky uh, at the upper level. And incidentally, this is darn good architecture. In fact, it's one of the best buildings in the world because Kling simply used the natural Victorian facades around the square as the decoration of his interior by making it all glass. Uh, we now move from there along uh, beneath the street to this, and this is the garden space looking that way at this building, that building, also designed by Kling. And uh, now we move over, there's another building also designed by Kling. And we move over to this, and there is the interior of this particular thing with the grass, glass roof galleria also at the same level, one level beneath the street, and the escalator going up also designed by Kling. Uh, but it would work the other way too. Uh, and I, uh, I think that it's an idea which, uh, which is worth uh, considering for other kinds of projects. Uh, this is the uh, view of the subway model, which was built by the Department of Public Property. And the marvelous thing that happened here is that I was able to drive architecture underground. I was also able to work out a contract so that the construction engineers of the subway had Vincent Kling not as the architect consultant to decorate the stations, but as a straight co-designer. So that all of the very forms of the subway stations and of the subway concourses as they connect through this area were designed by an architect and it was a straight projection uh, of the total concept of the system of organization. Then this, as you well know, is Villa Papa Giulia and in, designed by Vignola and I hope you've all seen it in Rome, or if you haven't, get over there and see it. And uh, <laughs> this is a, a very interesting project, and it's, it's, it's st striking similarity. You see, here's one level down, and then here's another level down, two levels below the street. Uh, and uh, I don't think Kling ever heard of it, but nevertheless, there's a happy connection between the two. And uh, here uh, are other views of the project. Here is the uh, end of the garden with the Municipal Services Building and this connection across here, which is frankly very exciting. And then this hole punctured here into this lower level space 
which is what actually greets you two levels down from the uh, subway car. And uh, you can uh, get a wonderful sense of orientation with our magnificent city hall uh, as an orienting point. And here you begin to see what is really uh, very startling, and I think will be surprised the architectural world when they wake up to it. Uh, here's a regular street going across. These are two different blocks, but this is a total foreground for that building, which, which is, is uh, uh, quite uh, surprising. Uh, there is the uh, uh, fountain which is built on top of the parking garage next door. You see the municipal service building. And this I want to show you because here is an example of an ancient building of ours uh, which we greatly love and which we cherish. And uh, this is the new structure that Kling and I worked out. And you see how carefully we related the plane of this uh, new building to the uh, thrust of the old building. And uh, we were even able to pull this foreground two blocks away and, and to give it a kind of setting and significance and position. And, and meaning in the city, which, which uh, tremendously enhances this whole area. It's a lot of fun, as a matter of fact, to sketch a thing like that on a little piece of paper and then have it built. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a lot of people think that dealing with this work is very frustrating because nothing gets built. I can tell you authoritatively that there are very, very few people that ever designed who had the satisfaction of seeing stuff happen on this scale, and it's really exciting. So try it. Uh, here is uh, a, uh, a drawing, uh, now we're coming into Market East. The thing we saw before was <coughs> City Hall and uh, Penn Center there, uh, which as you remember was generated by the 1952 model. Uh, this is the department store complex and this is the Society Hill Greenway which I spoke of here. And here is the connector which was the great problem, the Penn Center, uh, the, the Market East connector. This is Aldo Jurgula's, uh, I think, magnificent drawing of his idea for Market East. There is the subway where you look out at this great space, this great sort of uh, people forum, which is a simple idea of lowering the earth one level beneath the street and leaving the street itself high and dry as a bridge which passes through this open space. And incidentally, uh, that uh, thesis which I saw of the uh, community college, it has that in common with this, that it has the idea of, of a uh, passageway at an upper level which penetrates through the space. And it really was, as I said before, hard for Skidmore and Emerald to get the idea that the central feature of the main waiting room would be a street going right down the middle through the waiting room, but we finally got it across. Uh, this is uh, the Skidmore, Owings and Merrill model, which they built at my insistence, and which is an attempt to clinch the point of the belief which I hold with every depth I'm capable of that architecture is really generated by movement systems. And here is two levels beneath the street. Uh, there, here is, oh, I guess I'm really off base on this. I am off base on this, but never mind. Uh, here is uh, a movement system, two levels beneath the street. Here is the subway as it exists. Here is the commuter railroad as it will be connected with the other one, and there is the truck delivery with the four block uh, long underground street with the four uh, cores which connect it together. That is the base route of Market East, and I remind you again that it is directly derivative from the entire regional circulation system. It is not a separate project. It's a total, it's just simply a piece of a total regional transportation system. Here is a, uh oh, there, ha. Here is uh, one, uh, one level beneath the street. Here is the pedestrian way, which goes into the subway stations, and this is the hole punched through for the commuter railroad. And coming up here, uh, then here is the street level, uh, and here you see the street going right across through the middle of the open space, two levels down to the blue railroad and one level down to this uh, darker red uh, shape of opening for the uh, pedestrian way open to the sky. And there's where Gimbel's department store is going. And uh, I tell you that John Bauer, who is now the architect of Market East, replacing Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, 
uh, had some uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, dialogues with gimbals about how in the world to save a pedestrian space right through the middle of their department store. And it was his uh, terrific and, and, and uh, uh, wonderful sense of integrity of relationship to the whole concept. At the same time, his humanistic uh, ability to work with the realities of the business considerations that meant that I think the day has been won. We now come up one more level, and you see superimposed on this structure the uh, parking facility, which has its own ramps to the expressway, so that all these things weave together, subway, railroad, and then this is also the bus, uh, re uh, the commuter buses, and this is the long distance buses, and these are the vertical circulation of the, uh, of the uh, elevators. And although you may say that this is at a scale beyond Muncie, it is not true. Muncie has identically the same problems as this, and this identical same type of system of organization would work here just as well as it does in Philadelphia. Um, there is the whole thing pulled together. Uh, I'm putting that in the new edition of Design of Cities. Uh, I think it's a handsome thing. And now we move into the three-dimensional aspect of this. Here is uh, City Hall, and here is Wanamaker's. Here is uh, Strawbridge and Clothier's Litz, and there's old Gimbel's. And here was the idea of Gimbel's moving over here, and here is a new building which John Bauer is building between Wanamaker's and PSFS. And... Uh, so you see how this thing begins to grow. Now, the next stage of development of Market East, and the purpose of this is to show that a great project like this can be built by stages and can be a practically interwoven into the fabric of an old city without wrecking it. Of course, Philadelphia is much more difficult to change than is Muncie. Uh, you see uh, high rises growing here and so forth and so on. And then over here, uh, you see everything pulled together now with this continuous pedestrian way connecting everything together. Our original objective of tying the business center and the department stores together. And now you see uh, from the rear, uh, this is the old plan. And the thing that actually happened is that the parking was pulled out from underneath the buildings for various reasons and now has its own structure in this fashion. And although, again, you may say that this high-rise parking garage is not relevant to Muncie, even if it were a surface area, that had the same kind of relationship to the transportation system, uh, it would, uh, I think, be useful and relevant. Uh, we uh, now remind ourselves that this is accompanied by a uh, people street, uh, which is the really important part of it, which moves through this area. But this didn't all come about uh, just, uh, again, in the easiest possible way. I remind you that we started on Market East with Von Moltke. We then went through Jergala, and the power structure of Philadelphia said, uh, we can't let Jergala do this project because he's one of Bacon's people, and they are so impractical. So they said, we'll get somebody practical, like Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill from California. And uh, so Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill messed around with it, and uh, in the meantime, John Bauer, who was uh, formerly worked for the Planning Commission, was engaged by PSFS and Wanamakers to do a building between, which is shown here. And he did such a great job of that that he just automatically got support of the power structure and automatically moved in. Everybody forgot he was my man, I guess, but anyway, there he is. Here's, uh, here's the uh, section which Bauer did of uh, the Market East uh, City Hall and uh, the, uh, this, this is the subway. Here is Market East lower level and this wonderful idea of going down underneath escalator and back up again to his project and his subway, which opens up to the sky in this, this, this really wonderful way. Uh, this is the uh, larger cross section showing, it, 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 I think, quite an extraordinary thing. It's a later development of that plan. Uh, that plan was destructured and now it's restructured again. You look right across but you can't walk across the tracks for the third rail. So you zoop down and back up again, but you're always visually oriented. And uh, this is what it looks like uh, from a uh, drawing uh, beneath the street, the subway, the street level, and then the elevated walkway, which connects Wanamakers and Gimbals together. I mean, Wanamakers and PSFS at the upper level. And this is what that looks like in terms of a model. And incidentally, in terms of communication, I think you must agree that these models are rather extraordinary 
in terms of communicating the message. Here is the subway station, uh, and you will look directly from your car into this private lobby. And this solves the whole problem of terrible looking subways because the private owners will develop that. And then from this stairway, you look up to in that fashion, and from the subway, you see the sky, uh, which I was so anxious to have in the beginning. And uh, this is, now we're moving into the Market East. Here is the arrival by this commuter railroad, and you see that you're instantly oriented visually where you are. And here you are one level above, uh, and you see that you see the street going across and uh, the, the uh, railroad beneath. And uh, I think this sense of being oriented at every point is very, very important. And this shows how the street moves across from the surface of this being Market Street, and these are two garden spaces each side. At the lower level, the street jumps across into its own glass-enclosed structure through the middle of the uh, block. And here is a view at the level beneath the street with the open-air garden, and uh, here is another view uh, of these models that John made, uh, showing something of the intimacy, and yet, uh, at the same time, the large and, and rather elegant central open space and this uh, pedestrian movement up two uh, floors. That's one level above the street, which is the base of the elevators of the buildings. And uh, in this one, you see uh, something of the character and sweep, and you can see in the next street over at this point, the escalator uh, going up the other part of it. And uh, in this, I think you get a sort of a sense of this being architecture, which is a resolution, again, of regional movement systems. This structure of the, of the bus and the structure of the street and the structure of the pedestrians, uh, so that the architecture itself is really a reflection of the impingement from the outside of a whole range of uh, regional systems. And needless to say, this acted as quite an interesting uh, and effective motivation for getting things moving. And, uh, now we just uh, quickly wrap up by uh, reviewing where we have been. This is uh, the historical area. This is Market East. And we move over here toward uh, the new area of vitality, which is the crossing of the 1683 William Penn Axis and the new Metroliner, which connects Boston with Washington. We achieved our objective by making, getting rid totally of the <coughs> tendency of the vitality of the business moving westwardly and leaving an area of blight between. We nailed it down at the river, and we've got new buildings coming up here so that we have a central spine narrowed deliberately and richly served by transportation, which is vital the entire two-mile length, with good, healthy, in-town housing which butts it on the south without any layer of blight. And here is the area of the new vitality, and here we deliberately uh, plan uh, for the future. This is a, a Philadelphian's view of the Northeast Corridor. There is Washington, D.C. That is Boston, Massachusetts. This is our neighboring city, Manhattan, and that is Philadelphia. And uh, I, 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 I found it necessary to draw the perspective of this myself. The artist refused to do it. But uh, I think it worked out extremely well. And uh, I really, in a serious vein, make the point that simultaneously at one instant, you see the whole sweep of the geography as a functional entity, and you also sense the quality of the city and of the uh, buildings and so forth as they relate around that particular point. Uh, that point was, uh, which is here, that's this crossing, uh, was designed by Aldo Jergola in this fashion, a very uh, thrilling design, I think. And uh, uh, this shows his view of the buildings and that shows his view of the earth and the river and the interaction between the buildings, the earth and the river. And uh, this is the end of this particular peroration. Uh, this is the drawing by Irv Wasserman looking back over the whole situation. And what I hope I have demonstrated, at least I believe it to be true, that frankly unique among American cities, what you have here is perhaps not the greatest individual architecture. I'm incidentally giving a speech in Boston and comparing the two cities. Boston is a series of stellar and superb individual uh, uh, works of virtuosity, the Boston City Hall and the, the uh, Rudolph uh, State Building and so forth and so on, but that don't work together. And the thing that we have is that every part of it works together. And very soon you'll be able to walk 
from the uh, Delaware River through a complete series of garden footways into the different levels of Market East through to uh, Penn Center and out to the western side and it will all be a unified and organized concept. And at the same time that we did all that, we also revitalized Central City and struck a real blow for keeping the city economically and culturally alive. And the point of all this is that all you need to do is to have a design idea and stick with it, and it works just great. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, did you feel directly or indirectly the residential community? And if you did, what kind of housing was it? What kind of housing was it? Was where did they go? Well, the question, in case anybody didn't hear it, was. Did you deal directly with the residents of the area and did you throw them, that we didn't use those words, but that's what you meant, did you throw them out and if so, where did they go? Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I sort of thought you would ask that question and I really uh, could have started out by pre-answering it, but then if somebody said you were a very conservative group. I knew you weren't that conservative. Uh, the short time I had this evening, I dealt not at all with the whole housing program, and I would be absolutely excited maybe to come back someday and de develop another hour, which is exclusively on the thing you asked about how you work with residents of the neighborhood. The only housing that you saw was in Society Hill, and the number of people ousted from Society Hill was very, very small. And it was a deliberate policy on the part of, of the Planning Commission and myself that in order to save this magnificent 18th century uh, environment, it was necessary to create conditions which would inspire people who had the money, the resources, and the love to do it to move into the houses individually and restore them. Uh, the arrangement of the Redevelopment Authority was that each owner of each house was told what, if anything, he had to do to the outside in order to meet the environmental requirements. And if he would do that, he could do anything inside he wanted, including nothing. Uh, his property would not be condemned. And uh, a number of owners did, uh, in fact, do that. And uh, there is a fair mix of income, but it isn't particularly spectacular. Uh, in the total area of Philadelphia, I mean, this is only a tiny, tiny part, and it was for another reason. In the total area of Philadelphia, I think we worked out uh, some of the very finest methods of working with neighborhood groups that exist. And among other things, we, the city government directly subsidized locally elected uh, representative committees with the money to engage their own technical staff on their own basis without any interference with us about who they selected uh, to work with them on neighborhood improvement. So that, as I said, uh, this is a whole other area, and I uh, deliberately didn't try to load this with it in great depth. Yeah. A uh, rebirth what? Well, people moved back into Philadelphia from the suburbs at a, a great rate and an accelerating rate, and this will increase. And a number of the very deteriorated communities also uh, revitalized themselves uh, through a series of, of uh, efforts of their own. And uh, what we did from the very, very beginning, the first thing I ever did in 1947, which is one of the first redevelopment plans ever done, I said, I am totally opposed to broad slum clearance. I think it's absolutely wrong. I think that you've got to work with the people who live there. You've got, they've got to stay there, otherwise it's pointless. You've got to give the energy that the community needs by adding the community facilities that are necessary and cleaning out the very worst of the sore spots which you identify with the people there. Now that particular idea went full cycle. And the reformers came in and said that idea doesn't work. 
and they were responsible for moving the program back to large-scale clearance. But I survived all that, and now the whole thing is right back to the original idea. And at last, I'm beginning to get response to the idea of using scattered vacant lots as the basis for new housing. And uh, I, think, I think that, uh, again, in this area, but it's nowhere near so visible. Incidentally, the real test of success in working with a community is that your work is absolutely invisible. Now, that's a hell of a thing to tell an architect, but it's still true. And it's the architect's expression of their aesthetical virtuosity which caused some of the most appalling situations that exist. It's almost awful to beat a, bed, beat a dead horse, but Pruitt Igo by Yamasaki, I just remind you, cost like $32 million. And I read a, a Supremi who was the uh, head of the housing association, and uh, Yamasaki, at the beginning, before the project was built, and Dorothy Montgomery said it is inhuman and improper to put families with children in high-rise boxes. And Yamasaki said, yes, little girl, of course, you're socially right, but we have to be practical. So now the whole damn thing, $32 million worth, is going to be torn down. So that's just what practicality is. What's another question? No more. Good. Everybody's worn out, so I'm on.